All right, well, we got some attendees here, so I'm gonna just start and open with thanking you, uh, Christopher Santiago, for joining us today here at CLAX. Um, I'm the Associate Director, so my name is Sonia, and I just recently started this uh, position, and it's been important to me to increase Quechua programming um, and having an emphasis of the culture and history of the people that speak Quechua. And not only that, but expand it to, to the Americas and their role in um, fighting uh, climate change and how many indigenous peoples across the Americas, from the Dakotas to, to Chile and, and Peru, um, are leading these, these very important initiatives. So I did want to open and just acknowledge those peoples, first of all just by acknowledging the first peoples of the Americas from Canada to Chile. I think it's very important to acknowledge their, their presence and, um, and their investment in the environment. Um, so I would like to, to hand it over to you before, if you wanna do a brief um, introduction of the film before I start it, I'll share my screen. And then we'll afterwards, please, everyone hold on and we'll have time for question and answers. Question and answers in a short discussion. Okay. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Christopher Santiago. Um, I'm an anthropologist and I did my field work in Cajamarca, Peru between 2012 and 2014 with um, peasant uh, farmer people who were fighting a transnational gold mine, uh, which was owned by, um, a, m the majority of it was owned by an American company, 51.35%. Uh, I say this in the film, but um, over 50% of it was from Newmont, an American company. 43% um, uh, about was uh, Buenaventura, which is a Peruvian mining company. And then the last 5% was owned by the World Bank. And um, I guess I should mention that the, the people where I was in the north of Peru, they didn't speak Quechua um, as their primary language. There were two towns in the fight or in the area that were fighting the mine that did speak Quechua. Um, but even though there was, um, let's, uh, I mean, Cajamarca is the place where the Spanish kill Atahualpa and really the the beginning of the conquest of the Inca begins there. So there was a major impact on the indigenous culture there. Um, so I, I kind of, I, I guess, I guess I just want to say that at first it kind of seemed like the indigenous culture had fallen away in a lot of ways. But the more that I got to know the people and the more that I spent time out in the campo, out in the countryside, I realized more and more that it was, it was still there in certain maybe more subtle ways and it would pop up um, in their syntax, in certain words, Quechua words that they would still use, in the ways that they understood the landscape and the, the, the water, the lagoons, the rivers. Uh, the stories that they would tell about the lagoons and the rivers, the songs that they would sing, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, it was, um, it, I don't know, it was a big part of my research to try to stay open to finding these, um, these traces, I guess you could call them, or these, the, the way in which the indigenous culture would, would kind of emerge um, from the more obviously uh, mestizo and colonial culture. So, um, yeah, I guess that's, um, I, I mean, I could talk more, but the film says quite a bit about specifics, um, so. Right, I really appreciate your emphasis on the usage of song in these protests, in these indigenous movements, because it's much like the imagery we've seen here um, in Standing Rock and, and with the Lion 3 um, activist. So it, it's, it's something that I, I really want to bring attention to and how that's a, definitely happening across America. So I will start the film and we'll have a question and answer after. Okay. 
Singing, dreaming, and resistance among the water guardians of Cajamarca, Peru. Ominous black mountains, dawn peaks over the horizon. My name is Christopher Santiago, and I must warn you that there are some disturbing images ahead. Seven water guardians holding vigil over the Mamacocha Lagoon. In November of 2011, the lucha or fight against Conga began. Conga will be the second largest gold mine in the world. Worth $4.8 billion, it is the largest investment in Peruvian history. Conga's shareholders include Newmont of Denver, Colorado, with 51.35%, the Peruvian company Buenaventura, with 43.65%, and the World Bank's IFC with 5%. Congo will annihilate four highland lagoons, as well as rivers, streams, and wetlands composing the watersheds, which sustain three provinces and tens of thousands of people. First to be destroyed will be the Parole Lagoon. It will be turned into an open pit two kilometers across and one kilometer deep. Hundreds of water guardians meeting at the Parole Lagoon. The earth excavated from Parole will be treated with cyanide and then deposited into the Azul Lagoon, transforming it into an enormous toxic dump. Conga is expected to produce an average of 90,000 tons of waste tailings per day, every day for 17 years. In October 2012, two camps were formed to hold vigil over these lagoons. One camp was located on a hillside overlooking the Mamacocha Lagoon in the province of Walgayok, Bambamarca. The other camp was located in the province of Selandin, 
overlooking the Azul Lagoon. This second camp was on the Chaupe family's land. More about them in a moment. Eight cold, wet, and hungry water guardians inside a handmade tent. The flag of Selendine flying in the mist over the Selendine camp. Yanakocha Lagoon slash Yanakocha Mine before and after. Yanakocha Mine is 20 years old. The company took its name from the lagoon it devoured. The Konga Mining Project would be an expansion three times larger than Yanakocha. Water guardians staring in horror at the open pit mines of Yanakocha. A local newspaper headline reads, the Rio Grande is totally contaminated. Water that arrives at El Milagro water treatment plant has mercury, lead, uranium, and cyanide. The Rio Grande is now an artificial river, un affluente industrial, flowing out of long black tubes from Yanacocha, which read agua acida, or acid water. The Rio Grande is the main river of the city of Cajamarca. Peasant hands deformed by mercury. In 2000, 151 kilograms of liquid mercury spilled over a 25 mile long area, contaminating three mountain villages, including Choropampa. More than 900 people were poisoned from the spill. Peruvian National Police marching threateningly at the camera. In Peru, it is legal for the police to be privately employed by the mining company. Another law grants impunity to police who use lethal force. This was called a license to kill. A shrine to the five martyrs of water. There were two states of emergency in Cajamarca. The first came after a conflict with police up in the mines on November 24, 2011, leaving many peasants wounded including one man who was shot in the back and paralyzed from the waist down. The people rioted and burned the mining offices in the cities of Selendin, Wazmin, and Sorochuco. The second state of emergency came after five people were killed by Peruvian national police and military. Four in Selendin on July 3rd, 2012, and one in Bambamarca on July 4th, 2012. The youngest was 16 years old. He was shot in the head from a helicopter. The police and military occupied the city of Selendine for eight months. A restaurant filled with Peruvian National Police. Maxima Chaupe standing before the Azul Lagoon in her poncho and sombrero, her fist held high with dignity. I discovered that peasants fight with the weapons they have at their disposal. Music and dance, songs, stories, dreams, jokes, and divination by coca leaf. Singing and dreaming communicate and thus weaponize unconscious affects, which would otherwise be impossible to express. In this way, they can express the inexpressible. Peasants put their experiences into words through ancient melodies, carnavales, Huaynos and Yaravis, which date back to the Inca. Throughout the Andes, dreams are believed to tell the future. This can be defensive, making sense of traumatic experience, and also offensive by rewriting past traumas. Singing and dreaming 
turn trauma and suffering into healing and strength. Maxima Acuna Atalaya de Chaupe and her family live in the heart of Conga, right next to the Azul Lagoon. The mine wants her land. They've tried to evict the family, beaten them up, burned their straw huts, killed their animals, leaving two dead sheep in the road, and taking two more back to the camp to eat sheep head soup. They've built a fence around the Chaupe's house. The family often receives death threats and not to mention an exhausting court case brought against the family by the Yanacocha mine, all to drive them off their land, but the family has resisted. When the miners came onto their land, Maxima's daughter Hilda got on her knees to block the machinery. The miners told the police to get her out of the way. A policeman then hit her in the head with the butt of his gun, knocking her unconscious. Thankfully, Hilda was okay, but the family's medical certificates were denied as evidence in court, while the police claimed that the family had attacked them with stones, sticks, and machetes. The police didn't have medical certificates to prove this. Maxima Chaupe sings. Yo soy una gran queñita, yo soy una gran queñita, que vivo en las cordilleras, que vivo en las cordilleras. Paseando mis ovejas, paseando mis ovejas, en neblina y aguacero, en neblina y aguacero. Cuando mi perro ladraba, cuando mi perro ladraba, la policía llegaba, la policía llegaba. Mi chocita lo desataron, mi chocita lo desataron, mis cositas lo llevaron, mis cositas lo llevaron. Ingenieros policías, ingenieros policías, me robaron mis ovejas, me robaron mis ovejas. Cal de cabeza tomaron, cal de cabeza tomaron en el campamento de Conga, en el campamento de Conga. Camita yo no tenía, camita yo no tenía, con pajita me cubría y con pajita me cubría y comidita no comía y comidita no comía y solo agüita yo tomaba y solo agüita yo tomaba y por defender mis lagunas, por defender mis lagunas, me atacaron a balazos, me atacaron a balazos. La vida lo voy a perder, la vida lo voy a perder, por defender mis lagunas, por defender mis lagunas. The I endings are traces of Quechua in her Spanish, what some Peruvians call the barbarism. Maxima said that she did not sing before the trouble. It was these traumatic events that led her to start singing. One time, Maxima came to Cajamarca to tell her lawyer that in the night she'd been shot at. Maxima's lawyer told me that the police had been watching the peasant camp and saw that the men had gone down the mountain. Nobody except Maxima and four women remained. They heard shots, and the women were scared. They wanted to run for it. They didn't know what to do, and a few of them began to cry. Then Maxima said, No, don't run, compañeras. We are strong. Moreover, God accompanies us, and we are going to sing. Let's sing. At first they heard the bullets, but as the songs became stronger, they forgot about the bullets and began only to enjoy the song. Maxima said, 
compañera, sing. And we took each other by the hand and we sang and the bullets sounded. The lawyer admitted it was something when she told it. It left me, ah, we cried. Very strong, no? Truly, we were so moved, so touched. Senora Santos sings, holding a photograph of her son, who was killed by the police. Diciendo que somos terroristas, diciendo que somos terroristas. Maldito hay presidente, maldito hay presidente. Malditas autoridades, malditas autoridades. Su conciencia se vendieron, sus conciencias se vendieron. Por un poco de dinero, por un poco de dinero. No nos acobardemos, compañeros. Seguiremos en la lucha, seguiremos en la lucha. Si se trata que nos maten, si se trata que nos maten. Moriremos por el agua, moriremos por el agua. Y arriba la minera. A, abajo la minera, arriba nuestras aguas. No, tendremos que ganar con, ya con nuestra sangre. Y nuestras no, vidas no, haremos. No, no, no. Y defenderemos nuestras aguas con nuestras vidas. Y derramaremos nuestra sangre por el agua. In descending order, a dream witch, fire witch, and a witch that sucks on a person by Guamon Poma from the colonial era. The colonial ecclesiastical authorities outlawed such dream practices, telling people in Quechua, do not give value to dreams. Dreams are lies. They are not to be valued. By valuing their dreams as a source of truth, the campesinos are defying hundreds of years of colonial oppression. When I asked Senora Santos about her son's death, she narrated it to me through a series of dreams she had before the event. When the protests started, Senora Santos dreamed that a moto taxi was passing by a cornfield. This moto had a stick jutting out, and as it passed, it rolled up all the corn that was flowering. This leads to the chilling phrase, quote, it swept up everything. She initially interprets this dream as a sign that they will win the fight, but there is an inkling of what is to come, quote, it sure did dry them all up, and they fell, all of them. The corn is, quote, all old, all broken, all dry. The second dream she again misinterprets. She saw, quote, four flags in a row on both sides of the street, little white flags with their black letters. Four groups of people gathered, quote, and the four groups hugged each other. She thought, quote, we're already winning the triumph, but I didn't realize that I was already looking at the, the, my son who's gonna die. I'm gonna start mourning because of the black letters. When we consider that the four groups of people correspond to the four dead in Celandine, an uncanny affect manifests. Then shockingly in the last dream, which occurred the night before the tragedy, her arm quote, broke and quote, fell on the ground, but didn't hurt. She's left precisely without a meaning, quote, my God, what's going to happen today? She asked. Many people in the Lucha spoke of dreams as omens which foretold events. Here's another example. Before the police came and attacked the Chaupe family, destroying their chosas or straw huts, Maxima's husband Jaime had a dream in which stampeding bulls destroyed these same straw huts. Quote, they took everything on their horns. They took the wood, the straw, Nothing remained, yeah. Maxima and their children cried, quote, how are they gonna do like that? These wild animals that come to destroy our home. Other dreams are empowering, strengthening their resolve to fight. Maxima finds herself surrounded by lots of people she doesn't know. They wanna take her away to another place. They say, we are going, but she can't go. Quote, my shoe wasn't there. 
I had no sock. It seems illogical. Quote, what to walk with, she asks. It is almost as illogical as the police, under command of a transnational mining company, ordering you to leave your home. Now the encounter with the police appears as a game, emphasizing the sense of unreality of the events. A mob of people hold Maxima by her arms, just as the police did. This could be read as a trace of the traumatic experience repeating in her unconscious, but not exactly. It is precisely her force, which keeps this dream from being simply a compulsive repetition. An inner alchemy enables Maxima to transform the experience and rewrite history. In her dream, she wins. Quote, they shook me, but I didn't let myself play. In games, I beat them. Consequently, I hear a youth say, the senora has so much force because really she has beat me. He orders another person to hold her, but that's when Maxima, in her own words, quote, made force. I caught the hand of the boy and what way? I caught the two little fingers of the left hand and I tore them off. One time I asked Maxima, do you believe that dreams come true? She answered, yes, in my dreams that I have, it would be very occasional that perhaps it has not coincided. Otherwise, what I dream comes out exactly. It coincides. Some people who don't know me, who don't believe me, they said to me, no, the dream is a lie. It lies. They say, no reality comes of it. But for me, yes. As of today, the lagoons of Conga still exist, thanks to the efforts of my friends, the guardians of the lagoons. Thanks, everyone. Conga no va carajo. Well, we're not going to do that. Um, <laughs> maybe after the Q&A. But thank you. And I definitely want to hear more about maybe the current state of the water wars there in Cajamarca and the Chaupe family, if you're still in touch with them. And, and just kind of just, I would really would like to have you expand as I open up the Q&A about the dreams as this extension of indigenous knowledge. Sure. Um... So um, first off, I guess to say uh, is that the Conga project was officially suspended in 2017. So um, this is largely a success story, a victory. Um, you know, don't let anyone ever tell you that mass uprisings don't work or that protests don't work because this is an example of it working. Um, and uh, yeah, the Maxima and her family were in court for six years, from 2011 to 2017. There were two separate trials, um, and uh, they lost, um, and then there were appeals, and the, the company fined them, and they were in, uh, I forget what it's called, but uh, almost like house arrest, like they, not house arrest, but like they couldn't leave the province, um, so restrictions of their freedom. And, and the court, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, when they were finally acquitted and they, they finally won. It was Maxima, her husband, her daughter, and her daughter's, uh, at that point, boyfriend, but then husband. So um, that's, that's important to all say. Um, I guess I also want to mention uh, something that my Quechua professor at NYU, uh, Odi Gonzalez, said to me that I keep thinking about, and this idea that the, the, the conquistadors language or the Spanish language being insufficient to express what people are feeling or what people are going through or the trauma that they have, 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 have had experienced. So the singing and the dreaming um, kind of allows for that expression. That's why I say in the video that allows for the expression of what's inexpressible because um, I think that I needed to kind of give you a little more background for what that means to me or to them. Um, so one way in which that, um, what that means is that the Spanish is 
insufficient, let's say, to express certain um, certain experiences of the pe of the peasant people. Um, uh, I guess another another idea is that the the dreaming is both a way to rewrite history, like in the one dream that I tell you about, where Maxima is dreaming about being surrounded and beaten up again and yet in this dream she turns it around on the aggressors and she rips their fingers off i mean <laughs> she beat you know she she beats them um which is yeah so wonderful honestly and the other um way to think about this is that these are emergent futures right so you can also it's there's a rewriting of the past but also the possibility of emergent futures it's not that they necessarily exactly tell what's going to happen, but that they kind of give a person a warning or they give a person a sense that something is coming. And you don't always know still. They, I mean, in the, in the dreams of Senora Santos, she was thinking that it was a good sign at first. She thought that these dreams meant that they were going to win. And they did win eventually, but she didn't really realize at first that these dreams meant that her son was going to die. And I think that there's a way in which the dreams, because the, this is a dreaming culture, a culture of dreams, people take dreams seriously in the Andes, they, they remember their dreams, they hold on to them. And if a coincidence happens in the future, then they go back to that dream and they say, oh, that's what this means. That's what this, that dream meant. So there's a way in which the dream is kind of held open. It's, its signification or its, its interpretation is held open into the future until a coincidence occurs. And then they kind of retroactively understand the dream in terms of that coincidence. So that is a, a kind of a technical way to explain how dreams can tell the future. Um, and I guess the only other thing I wanted to mention is that um, Maxima's, when, when, when she says her force, right? She, she kind of conjures this force in her dreams and she fights off the assailants. Um, I didn't know this then, but through my readings of Andean culture, for instance, uh, Catherine Allen writes about something she calls Sami, which is, she translates as an animating essence or um, in a kind of inherent internally generated liveliness or power. Uh, you could think of it as like a spirit power. Um, if she also says that it's a kind of a genius or joyous, ebullient spirit. And I think that that is what is being conjured in these songs and these dreams, in often at least. Um, so she she also says that it's particularly singers that have this ability to, um, or have this sami, have this kind of uh, spirit power. So um, yeah, I, does it, if there's questions or or anything else that people want to talk about. Um, I can feel go free. into more detail about things. Yeah, feel free to submit your questions to the Q&A at the bottom of the chat or um, use the chat feature if you're able to. Um, I did want to ask you one thing about um, the community that you work with. And it's so good to hear this as a story of hope, because that's what we need right now especially given the water wars that are happening in Canada to all over um, and, and the Southwest here. Um, I'm just wondering what was their reaction or comment given that the Conga mines were owned mainly by Newmont in, in Colorado? Um, they were very angry at the transnationals as they called them. Um, and they would say that this is nothing new because the, they, they would connect it right back to the original conquest. And they'd say, the foreigners already came and stole our gold. Uh, we're not going to let it happen again. Um, that's how people would, would connect this, the current situation to this history of conquest. And I think that there's a way in which... Uh, values get flipped on their head. What, what most people think of as a progress, right? Money, gold, um, natural resources, uh, these become a curse. And this is another idea that I get from Odie Gonzalez, 
um, that these things like natural gas, oil, uh, water in terms of hydroelectric dams, um, gold, that these are supposed to bring progress. They're supposed to bring well-being, education, good health, but they end up bringing the opposite. Um, and I think a lot of people see it as 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 some as a long as hundreds of years of injustice, and this is just the kind of the most recent iteration of that of uh, you know what they call neo colonialism. Right. Um, one of our attendees has a question. Margarita Martinez Osario asks, uh, "What is the role of gender in shaping practices of resistance in Cajarbaca, and do women?" have a particular role in performing songs and interpreting or narrating dreams? That's a great question. Um, uh, okay, so it, it's, it's a little um, difficult, but because it, it's not like there are fixed roles exactly for men or for women, but things did kind of end up being a certain way more generally, but, but okay, well, let me just say, I, I saw men that would sing and dream as well, like Maximus' husband with the dream of the bulls that was in the video, um, and many others. Um, but I think maybe on the whole, yes, women would be more um, likely to be talking about their dreams in this way and uh, singing, but not not entirely at all. Um, and the women played a really crucial role, and I, I it's actually it's interesting to me because the resistance movement and the fight against the mine actually sparked more freedom for the women. Because um, it is a traditional place. It is a Catholic uh, and Protestant to some degree place. And it wouldn't be weird to hear that women weren't allowed out to go to the protests if their husband you know, didn't want them to. But that also changed in certain ways where I think the women were were, would kind of assume a more leadership position um, and they would leave whether their husband said they could or not. I would hear that sort of a thing. Um, and they would, well, also they would cook the food, which was a major, often the women were around the, what they call the olla comun, like, like the uh, common pot, which would feed the resistance movement. So that was crucial because people were starving up in the mountains. Um, let me just remind you that it's it's a, like 4,500 meters where this was up in the mines where this is happening. So it's very cold. Um, and the yeah, people were very hungry and cold. So the food was essential. And the women would also um, lead the chants often. If there were chant, if the the chanting was a major part of the protests, and the women would invariably be leading the chants. Um, they'd say, you know, um, this democracy is not a democracy, you don't impose law laws, that's like a translation of a type of a chant that they would do. And um, another thing that I saw women do is that they would get in front of the men sometimes, or yeah, often, when the men were about to kind of confront with the police, the women would get right in front because I guess they thought they wouldn't, weren't as likely to get beaten up. Um, and maybe the cops were a little um, unsure what to do at the moment, you know, because they, it, it was kind of throw like a, a surprise into the mix and it would deescalate the situation to some degree. Um, yeah. We have another question from Emma Bonham. Uh, how sure. long did you study Quechua prior to your research? And did you feel fluent when you began your work in Cajamarca or was it a learning curve as you spent more time with native speakers from the area? Okay, so yeah, I said this in the beginning, but I'll, I'll say it again. Um, there, wasn't, um, there wasn't a lot of Quechua being spoken in, in the area where I was in Cajamarca. There were two towns that still spoke Quechua. Um, so, but like I, so I, I did study Quechua for about a year and a half uh, at NYU with Odie Gonzalez before going there. And I'd spent time in Bolivia where people do speak Quechua, but um, I wasn't fluent in any way. 
but I did have a, a pretty good vocabulary. So I could hear words, I would recognize words, um, certain forms of syntax and things like that. And um, what I found really interesting was in Cajamarca, even though people didn't speak Quechua, Quechua words would pop up all over the place. The chakra, the pampa, um, lots of lots of words. Uh, and I was very happy that I had studied Quechua before going because I would have missed all that. Uh, also in the singing, if you if you remember, if you go back and listen to the song that Maxima sings, she says things like um, Toma Bai instead of Tomaba, like instead of saying that they took her stuff, she adds this I ending to the end of the word. And I asked someone else about that and they said it was a barbarism, uh, which I guess, you know, that was a pretty racist comment, but um, that's, that's what you find in Peru. A lot of people are racist. A lot of people are either ashamed of the indigenous culture or they shame other people for being indigenous or even just having traces of being indigenous, like I'm saying. Um, so a lot of the struggle was about trying to reaffirm the indigenous and campesino culture. And John McDowell asked, how does your report connect with Donacio Hija de la Laguna? Um, is that the film? The film Hija de la Laguna, I think. Let me look that up. I, I think it's yes. a film. Um, yeah, um, I forget what was her name. The 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 protagonist of that movie. Um, I forget her name, but I I've met her. Um, yeah, I, that was a that was a great movie. Um, Nelida. N N Nelida, yeah, yeah. Um, I th I liked the segments in that movie where she is, in a sense, talking to the water. There's almost like a prayer um, or a kind of a yeah, I don't know, talking with um, the lagoon and the water, which um, after reading a lot about the Inca and the Spanish uh, perception of the Inca was that they speak to devils, literally, um, pr pretty much quote um, from some of the conquistadors and some of the uh, priests that they that the indigenous people speak to devils. And what that really kind of means was speaking to wakas, which are which can be many things, but um, statues or um, places or anything that kind of holds sacred power. And um, yeah, there, there's endless kind of accounts of this about the people talking to mountains, talking to the sun, talking to the ocean, talking to the lagoons, the, the Pachamama, the Mother Earth. Um, so I, I really like that, how they tried to represent that for the, for the audience to, to show you what that prayer to nature might look like. Do you have plans on returning to Peru? <laughs> um, well, this is actually a kind of a sore subject. Um, I'm actually banned from the country. Oh, that's a, let's hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I got detained for being in a protest with a sign that said, uh, water is sacred. I know, terrible, right? Terrible message to be sending. and. They, uh, I was also up in the camps the night before and the police had destroyed the camps that night. So I was in one of the camps right before it got destroyed. And the people that were in the camp came down and were marching in the streets and protesting and very pissed off and uh, doing media um, kind of events, you know, talking to the cameras and stuff. And uh, there was a roadblock. They were blocking the road for, um, so the mining company couldn't get through and they were literally rolling large rocks like almost boulders into the road and i tossed a seriously like a pebble underhanded it into the blockade 
and uh, they happened to get me on camera. So the next morning I'm eating food in the market and I get surrounded by cops. They take me to the, to the police station. They're questioning me. They wanna know who I know, what I'm doing there. I keep telling them I'm a tourist. And then uh, they, they kind of like uh, buying that for a while. And then all of a sudden they say, oh yeah, you're a tourist? Well, who's that? And they point over to a TV and they have me on camera. And I'm like underhanding this little pebble. And I'm like, uh, I guess they're like, is that your doppelganger? And I'm like, uh, I guess you got me. So, and then another interesting moment was when one of these police officers was questioning me and questioning me and wanted to know everything. And I, he says, you know, are you with the people against the mine? And I was like, no, I'm not with the people. I don't know them, but personally I am against the mine. And I said, what about you? And he looked around to see if any of the cops were listening. And he said, me too. And he shook my hand. <laughs> so um, there was a lot of weird back and forth between perspectives. I mean, the, the, the locals would often say to the cops, they would like Senora Santos specifically, I remember her yelling at the cops saying, you are children of peasants. You're children of campesinos. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? You don't know who you are. You don't have you know, don't you use water? <laughs> don't you wash? Don't you, you know, make, don't you drink water? It, it's this kind of absurdity that, that they would really uh, zero in on. I thought it was kind of an indigenous critique or, you know, a local critique that was really spot on. Um, but yeah, the miners and the cops often were, I would say, alienated from their own heritage and ashamed of it. Right, absolutely. And, and that is something we're seeing um, transnationally is this water is life message, right? It, it seems so um, inherent to, to our, our rights, but, but yet it gets denied. Um, I wanted to turn your attention to um, our director here at Clax. He wanted to, he's running the recording on the other screen. So he wanted to know about your filmmaking process. And if you set out to make a film and, or did you develop it after the fact? Okay, well, it's funny because I was, I became very close with uh, a Peruvian who was from Lima, but I, I meant to thank him actually, I should say that now. Alec, his name is Alexander Luna. He took um, the, the, the really high quality video of, of Maxima that you saw and the photo of her with her arm up, which is so iconic and amazing. He took that photo. Um, I was with him, I was sitting right next to him when he filmed her singing, and I have my own lo-fi quality but uh, video. But um, So he was making a film, and uh, I was kind of just documenting things. I was taking short videos of people when they would sing songs, uh, when they would tell about dreams, and other sorts of stories and things like that. Um, and I wasn't planning to make a film, but then uh, last year with the pandemic, the AAA was virtual and they were asking for, for videos and stuff. So I, that's why if you notice, I'm kind of giving captions, like I'm, I'm describing the images. That's because they told me to do that for uh, hearing impaired and, and um, other, other people that might want that. So um, that's why it's like that, but yeah. Um, the videos were so powerful. That first video that you see, that you hear, the, it's, it's kind of dawn, it's, it's like a very dark video, the fir very first video. That, I'm so glad I filmed that because that was kind of a, um, like a magical kind of a moment for me. It was literally dawn in the camps. Um, I was walking from tent to tent because I was hearing everyone singing in all the different tents. It wasn't, it wasn't synchronized, you know, no one was kind of orchestrating this people were just waking up or, or the, maybe they'd been awake all night long because the cops were not very far away and they were, you know, right there. So uh, people were awake and vigilant and they were chewing coca, uh, drinking cañasso, smoking cigarettes, passing it all around. And finally the dawn came and I just started, along with the birds singing, I was hearing the people singing as they were waking up. And I just, it, it was so... Um, so magical. I don't know how else to describe it. And I would walk from different tent to tent and they invited me in. They were like, 
they're like, oh, gringo, come on in. You know, they, they're so inviting. I can't tell you how warm and inviting these people were. Um, they let me kind of write in. Some of them would be like, are you with the mind? You know, they, they were, some of them were, were skeptical, but I don't, I guess I won them over. I don't, I don't really know, but they were so open and so inviting. Um, I just, yeah, I, I want to say that too. Very, very, they really know what hospitality means. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't set out to make a film. I, uh, I'm planning on writing my book, honestly. That's what I want to get back to, but I want to use a lot of images, um, photographs, and descriptions of some of these films and, and the songs and stuff, but. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking, I was going to link your article to the chat. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's not published yet, but um, hopefully soonish. Uh, <laughs> uh, one day, I'm not sure, but um, uh, I'm open to criticism. You know, I'm, I'm still kind of working on it. So if anyone wants to talk about it, I'd be happy to. I'm also thinking about some of the things that I saw in town. For example, in Cajamar, uh, in Selendin, the there was a stadium, and the stadium was occupied by the military and the police for eight months. So this city was occupied by the armed forces for eight months. I mean, literally marching down the street in their uniforms with their guns. Sometimes I would hear them, I would hear about this, that, that they would point their guns at people just to scare them. Um, there was, uh, people would say that I, I would see this uh, graffiti around town and it would say Sendero Luminoso, which you hope some of you might know is a, a, a kind of a terrorist organization from the 90s, I think, um, 80s, 90s. I believe, 80s, 90s. And um, I would ask people, what is this? You know, are there, is Sendero Luminoso around here? And they would say, no, the police did that. So the police, according to the locals, the police were making Sendero Luminoso graffiti in order to accuse the locals of being terrorists. Um, I would hear also rumors that the armed forces were urinating and defecating in the water supply of the town. And there were um, about 10 underage women that were impregnated. And then when the armed forces left, they, they were left single mothers. So uh, there were a lot of impacts on the local communities and local towns. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's eerily familiar to, to what's happening in the States here um, and in Canada with uh, the Royal Mountain Police kind of planting evidence or, or um, having kind of spies infiltrate the, these movements, these protesters. And so I think one thing that you said that, that struck me and I do wanna point out is just how generous and open these communities were. And I think that's definitely indicative of, of this, this global indigeneity, right? Like this, this, those that have so little are often the ones that give the most. And so it's, it's just very, very good to hear that, that that was your experience. And, and I'm glad that you went so hard in Peru and you can't go back there, but, but yeah, that's, that's good work. And, I look forward to to reading, to sharing your article. I can't find it, but we'll we'll have this video up um, on our Clax YouTube, and we'll definitely link all that together. Um, I guess just one other, um, or I don't know how much time we have, but one one other kind of really poignant fact is that Cajamarca is the poorest region of Peru. I mean, sometimes it changes its place, but it, for a while, it's been the poorest region, and. This is a $4.8 billion gold mine, literally. Um, I mean, you know, how ironic is that? Um, and and, and the, the, um, the, the, the Department of, of Cajamarca has received four, uh, 418 million soles from mining, um, what are they called? Mining revenue or mining royalties, mining royalties. So it's like, where is that money going? I mean, you know, it, if it's supposed to actually bring progress, then where where's the progress besides poisoned rivers and um, you know a lot of other nasty things? Um, 
so yeah i guess um i guess that just is more about this idea of that gold is a curse <laughs> yeah and and as you said um the woman in your film ha has said like it, it's nothing new i mean since the 16th century the spanish crown has been extracting these minerals from from this land and and hopefully you know there is more stories like this where where there's there's such strong pushback that there is actually you know some some agency given to these communities that, that are living there and fighting so hard for for these rights yeah but if we have any more questions, please um, submit them now. But if not, I'm just really grateful you were able to be here and shed some light on this topic and, and this, this ongoing issue. I mean, one other thing that I should mention is that uh, to my knowledge, there have been no reparations to the families that were uh, that you know lost loved one, loved ones at the hands of the police. Um, the case was archived, I believe, uh, after a lack of evidence. Um, you know, and the police would say that they weren't using lethal weapons, so they don't know how this happened. The peasants must have been shooting each other. I mean, it's just cra crazy things that you hear uh, in order to deny what happened. <laughs> you know, kind of really absurd lies and and just. It's like they'll do anything rather than face up to what's happened. Yeah, I was really drawn to your film and just because of my own experience with Quechua and learning, like that that's how I learned Quechua is through these songs, the repetition, the melody, the cadence, like that, that's what kind of helped so much. And, and I could definitely see even these communities that aren't fluent or, or first language Quechua speakers kind of borrow these traditions and these songs, especially in times of resistance. So I am very happy to, to read your article and, and to hear you discuss that. Yeah, I, I don't know if you know um, Argetis, the, the eth ethnographer and literary figure, um, but he has a great, he, he has a book about Quechua songs, and in the introduction, he says that um, he believes that that Quechua can go beyond Castellano in the expression of sentiments that are that most characterize the indigenous heart, tenderness, affection, and the love of nature. And he says Quechua expresses all this, the all the emotions with equal or better intensity than Spanish. <laughs> so. Yeah, there's something really effective, something really moving um, and intense about listening to these songs. And I, I love the that it's kind of like the suffix space language, so it's very specific, and and you can have this really long word, but it's it's very detailed and who the speaker is, what emotions are being conveyed, and and that's why, although difficult, I it, it's my it's why I'm drawn so much to Quechua. Yeah. I don't know if, uh, Dan, did you want to pop in and say anything in closing? Sorry, hold on one second. Oh, by the way, this is a sombrero. <laughs> Everyone in, in Cajamarca would have a hat like this. These are handmade woven very, very fine so that water can barely get through. Um, they're really great hats. That's beautiful. Uh, uh, um, thank you so much for uh, sharing your film and your observations and for that interesting dialogue with Sonia. And uh, thanks to everybody who was able to come this evening or if you're watching this video after the fact on YouTube. So uh, we really appreciate your participation and we look forward to uh, talking more in the future in person or virtually or however we're able to get together. So thanks everybody very much and, and good night.